to. Um... You, you can Hello, start now. Hello, I everyone. We are slowly letting everyone in. We do have a last couple of test notes happening here. So don't worry, folks, you are in the right place. My name is Sadie Uribe and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for the Los Angeles Regional SBDC Center. Uh, you're going to be seeing a little movement happening, so just don't worry. Um, we are opening up the session and you know how live recordings are. We are getting everything set, ready and set for you. We are going to let some uh, participants roll in, but I'm very excited because we have a wonderful panel today of experts from all over the country. So it's very, uh, fun to hear stories from the East Coast where, I, I mean, I used to live a couple of years ago, and as, as we call this, I'm just literally sharing stories with you folks, because we have so many participants today, and we are going to learn so much about how to deal with port congestion, so our experts here are going to, I would say, give you this expertise that we have, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to hear from them. So on that note, I think I'm going to let Simona do our actual introductions here because I do see a good amount of folks here uh, getting ready to settle in with their coffee and get ready to learn. So Simona, on that note, I say you take it away and say hello to all our wonderful attendees today. Thank you, Sadie, and good morning and welcome to our fourth program under the LA to DC Goes Global Trade Series. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'm Simona Resek. I'm one of the Los Angeles export advisors, and I also manage the LA SBDC Go Global Trade Program. Today's topic is how to deal with port congestion. We have great speakers ready to examine the complexity of the port congestion problem and give us insights into the possible solutions we have today. The goal of today's program is to help our exporters and importers understand the depth of this complex problem, the role of each party in the supply chain in order to better communicate and negotiate your transactions with foreign buyers and sellers. I will be collecting your questions from both the Q&A box and the chat, so please use the Q&A box, use the chat throughout the program, um, ask the speakers questions, make sure we are addressing all of your questions. That is my role to collect all of, all of your questions and to make sure um, we do uh, keep our communication with you throughout the program. A few words about who we are. We are America's SBDC, America's nationwide network of small business development centers. SBDC centers are hosted by leading universities, colleges, state economic development agencies, and private partners. We are funded in part by the United Congress through a partnership with the SBA. We have nearly a thousand local centers throughout the nation available to provide no cost, one-on-one -on -one business advising and low cost training to new and existing businesses. If you're not familiar with our services, please find your local SBDC at the link listed on this slide and let us know how we can support your business growth. The host of today's programs are the Los Angeles SBDC and Virginia SBDC International Trade Department. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. The Los Angeles SBDC Global Trade Program is hosted by the Ventura Economic Development Collaborative and Virginia SBDC Trade Program is hosted by George Mason University. To the contact information for both programs will be listed on the slide. Please do connect with us. We are here to support your global expansion and global growth. Uh, the LASBDC Go Global Trade Program includes no cost focused one on one technical advising in all the areas listed on the slide from developing export plan to learning about your e commerce digital tools to international financing. We support you prepared to speaking with the lenders to make sure when you have that one opportunity to impress the lender, you are well prepared to answer all the questions. One of my role as an SBDC expert advisor is to make sure you have access to all the local state federal programs that will support your international growth. For example, making sure you're aware that the SBA Export Express Loan Guarantee can be used for export development, including your e-commerce development. Um, if you, um, uh, the best way to contact us is through the phone number, the email, and the website listed on this slide. Um, our LASBDC speakers today are trade experts. Uh, next slide, please. We have Dr. Ray Bowman, the Los Angeles SBDC International Trade Director, 
also the Ventura and Santa Barbara SBDC director. Dr. Bowman is an international trade business veteran with more than 30 years in international trade um, expertise. He's also a Los Angeles DAC member, a lecturer, a business and trade analyst. Um, we lost a speaker today. We lost Vincenia Coppella, but we gained a new speaker. Marian Rodan is with us today. We're very excited. Marian is the CEO of eMerchants Trade Council. Marian actively engaged in work custom organization initiatives, including taking on leadership roles with the private sector consulting group and serving three terms as the co-chair of the uh, word tray, uh, of the work custom organization group on e-commerce, which produced a framework of standards much needed in the industry. She's recognized as a key technical trade expert and has served as an SBDC advisor. Thank you for joining us at a short notice today, Marianne. And now I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to my colleague, Aaron Miller, the Virginia SBDC International Trade Director, our partner who is supporting in making this program possible. Aaron, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Please introduce the Virginia speakers in our collaboration. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Simona. And thank you, Ray and Marianne, for your partnership. Um, the Virginia SBDC, I'm, I'm serve as the director of the International Trade Program, but we have a, a nice uh, team of well-rounded experts, including myself. I have two uh, colleagues um, that bring more than 40 years of experience in international trade. We provide many of the same services uh, that the Los Angeles SBDC does as well, and you can learn more on our webpage about that. Uh, we're also really excited to be part of George Mason University and being able to tap into that network of just really uh, smart young people who are looking to start a career and uh, get some real world experience and, and leverage this opportunity to work with the SBDC to go on to, to bigger and better things for them in their own careers. I uh, also want to just thank our, our many partners in Virginia that we uh, definitely utilize to support our Virginia exporters. And uh, so just a, quickly about our collaboration, as Simona mentioned, this is the fourth program that we've done over and the first one in 2022. We started it last year um, as a way to kind of collaborate uh, together. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what the LA SBDC does as a program um, and the expertise that they've had. They've been really instrumental in, in helping us develop our e-commerce uh, program and uh, many other things throughout the year. So we find different topics to discuss where um, perhaps a coastal perspective uh, can serve us all well. And I know uh, that's somewhat maligned uh, these days with uh, coastal elites being the new, you know, um, boogeyman of sorts. But uh, when it comes to uh, looking at international trade and specifically the uh, ports and what is going on on each of these ports, it's really important to do that. So I'm excited to round out this panel with uh, two Virginia uh, natives. Uh, first, uh, Alan Peterson. Alan is with uh, the company T-Mike, uh, which you can read about a little bit there in his uh, bio. But Alan has a long career supporting heavy industry and working in uh, container ports and shipbuilding in Virginia. He's joined T-Mike Americas in 2006, heading up the Crane System Business Group. Um, there he oversees T-Mike solutions and container automation and advanced lifting equipment technologies. Uh, we had the privilege of um, hearing Alan speak at a Virginia DEC um, program at the port in Norfolk uh, about six or seven years ago, and he gave an overview, and then uh, we lifted up the uh, the screen to look at this incredible, look out at this incredible port and, and just see um, the cranes and the automation at work. It was really quite a memorable um, meeting we had down there. So Alan, thank you so much for, for joining us um, today. And our other speaker uh, from Virginia is John Saylor. And I think John was our deck chairman at that time that we held the um, that meeting down there in Norfolk. Um, John has been 
you know, active in international trade for many decades. He is the past commissioner for the Virginia Port Authority. He is a freight forwarder and customs broker. He brings a diverse uh, maritime background as a major exporter for Brown and Williamson tobacco. Um, but John is one of those rare birds that uh, really combines the practitioner expertise with that policy wonk uh, inside him. And he's been instrumental in leading efforts on the Hill and with new administrations, both educating and advocating for international uh, trade policies that, that benefit U.S. exporters and U.S. companies overall. So uh, just real quickly, again, we have our, our contact information for both the Los Angeles and the Virginia programs. If you're outside of our territories, you can find uh, your local SBDC at that um, third link. And with that, I will turn it over to Ray to get us started here. Thanks. Great. Well, well th thank you for the introductions, both Simone and Aaron. We're real excited to be here. Um, it's, it's my honor to, to be the moderator of, of our program and sit with these experts here uh, who, you know, if you look at the combined amount of experience in international trade and customs, it, uh, it's just a privilege to be a part of this group and, and, and help moderate this program. So we're going to try to um, accomplish a couple things in this program. One is in talking about the, the container congestion, uh, it's not about one thing, it's about a lot of different things. So we're gonna try to cover, if we can, about 10 things that, that are kind of the choke points or the levers that have led to some of this container, uh, you know, port congestion, um, you know, to kind of just sort of deconstruct what's going on in, in, in terms of, of of how this, how we got there, how this is all happening, because it felt like it happened overnight, but it really didn't. There were a lot of things that led up to this. The other thing we're going to try to do is talk about this also from the lens of the small business, um, because small businesses in general don't have the economies of scale, don't have you know the staff and the best practices and and uh, all of the resources of much larger importers and exporters. So. We want to keep in mind throughout our talk, whenever we can, um, you know, recommend some best practices for those small businesses or things they ought to be aware of. We also want to do that as well, because it's one thing talking about port congestion, the problems, but we also kind of want to relate it back to uh, what our small businesses should be doing, what they should be aware of. Um, it's going to be kind of a free flowing discussion. So I, I'm just going to put a topic out there and then, uh, and then sort of let everyone weigh in on it. Um, so the first thing, you kind of have to start at the beginning of the port congestion. And the beginning really starts with the carriers, uh, the various ocean carriers, and how things have changed. And, and when you think about it, during, during this pandemic period, there's a 445% increase in container demand. Right, so a uh, huge increase in container demand, and that's had, and there's all kinds of dynamics with that. Um, there's been changes in in how uh, carriers interact with each other. Um, I came from the old days where you know it was one ship, one carrier, and a lot of that's changed. We now have alliances, um, uh, which cause all kinds of dynamics in and among themselves. So um, my first question to the panelists is, can you tell them, tell the audience a little bit about what's going on in terms of the carrier, you know, and then we'll kind of move on from there, from the carriers to the ports and so on. But uh, what are some thoughts? I, I, I know, John, you've spent a lot of time in the ports and, uh, you know, I don't know if you'd like to kick us off or Marion. You're on mute, sir. You hear me now? It's a stat. You only we yep. only do we only do Zoom and Team Cons, you know, 15, 20 times a day, and it's always the same thing. So I always remember when they did a, a conference with uh, Putin and 
and uh, Biden last year when they were, I kept saying, can you hear me now? And Putin says, who's talking what? He says, you're on mute, you're on mute. And so it, it happens to everybody. Uh, no, I, the experience of looking at the carriers, I was just thinking about when you're talking about the history. There's a, uh, going dating myself back in the in the 80s, I was chairman of the National Maritime Council here in Washington. So we had, at that time, our objective with all the, uh, the carriers, but that was the point that we were trying to uh, protect the U.S. flag interest. So you know how well that turned out. Uh, so you see this whole thing evolve and one of the issues we have here in the United States, we don't have all the, all the major carriers are foreign owned. Uh, <clears throat> friendly, you know, I'm not gonna talk about the Chinese, but we got the Danes and we got the guys in Switzerland, you know, at, at MSC. But as you said, Ray, it used to be, you dealt with one carrier, they had their, you know, you went and took a look at where their routes were, what you're doing, you work with them, you call them, uh, you work with your forwarders to do all that. And now all of a sudden, you know, you have these consortiums that are going on and you don't know what ship is going. You may have a bill lading from one carrier, but that's not the ship it was carried on. You don't know where it's sailing out of it, how they're doing it. You're kind of lost. Uh, as we were talking yesterday, and we'll get into this further, and I want you know your input as well, it's about the importance of, of bringing and initial stages in with your freight forwarder and your custom broker, you know, <clears throat> start talking to them. For me, there was a time and in, in a long time ago when I was with the cigarette companies, I mean, I had carriers banging and knocking on my doors, wanting my business because I had thousands of containers going out. Now, you know, you fast forward where are today, I'm a small exporter, a small importer, you know, they're not going to talk to you. You're not going to talk to the carriers. You need to go through your forwarder that will be able to handle that. And it's, the whole dynamics has changed completely. Um, the, the Their operation uh, of, of what they're looking at going to the, the major shippers, and we're talking here about the smaller shippers, uh, smaller exporters, smaller importers of what you can and cannot do. And you, you're kind of limited, and you're going to need all the help you can get uh, to, to do this. And I think that the problem is that if you go to a, a gathering, there's a trade event or something, and you'll see the carriers there and you'll get a lot of great lip service from the marketing people, but you know, try to get a hold of their operations people. If you have issues that are going on, talking to the ports, it's difficult. So I, I go back and I'm gonna turn back to you. Maybe Marion wants to have because of talking about the smaller, smaller shippers in there, but go ahead, Marion. Yeah. You know, just to take a historical perspective to add on to what John was saying is. You know, we used to have a couple of U.S. flagged carriers for national security reasons, because that's how at one time we moved U.S. troops overseas. That changed in the Gulf War um, in, you know, 1990. And so that dynamic started to change. And because of how we handled deregulation to a certain degree, there was just less investment in transportation assets. And the innovation, I think, in supply chain in general for the United States was really in automation and IT, you know, for, let's say, Walmart, for example. And on the shipper side, rather than on the carrier side, there was just a general disinvestment. And let's face it, uh, the transportation business, not all segments, but a lot of it can be a low margin business. And that's why you do see a reduction in the number of carriers. At the same time, over you know, 20, 30 years of my career, you've, we have moved from uh, the top 1,000 importers and exporters import and export 70% of the goods by volume and value. That was, I think, the general rule of thumb up until a couple of years ago. And e-commerce is one part of it, but you do have small and medium-sized enterprises um, increasing their cross-border shipments. So that has changed the dynamic as well. Um, and that's a good thing that SBDC certainly has promoted because of the SBA and Congress to get more small companies to um, engage in global trade. But that does have a consequence for the balance between, you know, the number of carriers and, you know, the composition of the shippers that they're serving. Also remember that all the problems that we're seeing in port congestions are the culmination of longstanding issues, okay? So whenever we've had what I call a trade interruption, 
whether it's the Fukushima plant, um, let's say Hurricane Sandy, or even a government shutdown, I knew that we could only withstand about 18 days, 18 to 25 days of a shutdown before we really had major supply chain problems. Now, COVID and, and you know, the larger economic issues of shutdowns, economic shutdowns, so we've never seen, um, at least in modern human history, has just exposed all those longstanding issues. Um, and obviously one of the, the big issues from the shipper side and a policy side is because we have so much of this East-West trade from China to the United States and back, there's a pronounced mismatch between the type of product that's imported versus exported. Yeah, well, and, and one of the things I think about, <clears throat> especially regarding our, our audience of small businesses, is, you know, when I started in the shipping business in the 80s, <clears throat> you know, a large ship was 2,000 containers. You know, that was a huge ship that came in. Uh, now we have ships that are, you know, 10,000 containers, 20,000 container uh, ships being configured. And you say, great, these are, these are nice big ships and they hold a lot of capacity. But then you think about the fact that these ships are being shared between several different, you know, carriers sharing that capacity on that ship. Plus, you have the complication of those ships now take, you know, four days plus to offload, right? So, so and, and, and then you think about, you know, these huge ships as being this huge sort of uh, <clears throat> blocks game, you know, and, and how these containers come on and off according to carrier and destination and so on. So, you know, it, it really compounds the productivity, but I think for our small businesses, one of the things that it's done is this demand has, has spiked container rates immensely. I mean, I remember for decades, if you were talking about container rates, you were talking the two, three, four thousand dollar range and now we're seeing containers routinely, you know, 10,000, 14,000, 18,000, 20,000. Uh, had a client the other day, $28,000 for a container. And keep in mind, for most small businesses, the average value of a container is about $45,000. So if you look at the, just the impact on what you have in the container, if you're shipping, you know, canned goods or clothing. And I, I think for our small businesses, with, you, you know, one of the tough things about that is it's forced them to buy containers on the spot market, which spike even more. And, and so, you know, keeping that in mind, our, you know, our small businesses really need to plan ahead because they're often subject through their freight forwarders, through the carriers, you know, to go on to that, that spot market, you know, and, uh, you know, so congestion leads to price hikes, leads to, uh, really impacting our, our, our small businesses. And so that kind of transitions to the next part, which is port productivity. And, you know, if you imagine at any given port, you have multiple bursts and some bursts are, 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 are really productive, others not as productive. Um, I'm always struck by some of the numbers. So as I recall, you measure a birth by, you know, how many movements they can do per hour. And, you know, some areas of, of the world, uh, you know, I, I think in our West Coast ports, it's somewhere about 75 movements per hour um, on average, but there's some bursts that can go 150. So, you know, I, I want Alan to kind of weigh in on this because you're all about port productivity. And I'm wondering if you can give our audience some sense of, of, of what that looks like. And, and how productivity really impacts a port and, and, and leads to the congestion. Well, thanks. Um, I, would, I would look at it at the beginning, why do we try to automate and, and talk about productivity in general first? Um, I was in LA Long Beach right before Christmas for a couple of weeks, uh, visiting with the various ports. And what hit me was two things. In the midst of 
all those ships sitting offshore waiting to come in, uh, the backup for the trucks to get in the gates was huge. Um, the productivity of getting them into the port and then back out was not what it should have been. The other thing that occurred to me in two of the different terminals I was in, there were cranes at the dock sitting idle because there was not a ship at the berth. And when I would ask, where, why aren't we working those four cranes? The answer was quite simply that we didn't have the gangs available to come in and work the cranes. So it was short of people. Um, productivity is impacted by so many things in a port environment. I'll boil it down to just two or three things that I work on a lot. First of all, the only reason to automate anything in the port environment is to gain consistency of operation. Um, we say in our business that automation will never be the best operator you have, but it will be your average operator. So if I can do automation slightly above average, we think we come out ahead. And I think the numbers bear that out over time. So if you look at that, however, there are really only four terminals in the United States that are automated terminals if you look at crane handling environments. A lot of the terminals have automated gate environments. They have just lots of pieces of automation. Um, but very little has been done to integrate our terminals in the US from beginning to end in an automated environment. When I look at some of the other parts of the world, um, Asia is going down that path much more rapidly than we are. Uh, we were uh, happily involved in Qingdao and at Yangshan near Shanghai to provide the two fully automated terminals in China with their systems. Um, and we only do the crane piece, but they've automated the whole doggone thing. Um, they have a different set of labor situations than we have, so they, they can do that sort of thing quickly. Um, but it, it's all about what you're willing to embrace and how much money you want to spend, because it's not cheap. Um, productivity, however, if you look at some of our manual terminals, I point to Charleston, South Carolina perhaps um, one of the most productive birth environments in the country, totally manual operation. So it's doable. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that too. Well, as, you know, excuse, I, yeah, I was just gonna say as, you know, when I, when I was a commissioner at the ports, so I used to look at the, uh, the same, and it's not like it is now, but I mean, at the time is a moving stuff, the productivity, we we're always concerned, you know, it's the, especially on the cranes that we, Virginia uh, is one of the first, we developed the uh, design, a dual hoist crane where you're loading one container while you're loading one container on, you got that. It just, are, just keep going constantly. It's trying to speed it up. But, you know, I made the comment yesterday and I was standing at the control center at NIT overlooking the, at Norfolk International Terminal. So look at everything below me and you see all those containers coming in and you look at like, as, as Alan said, the backup, at the gate going out, the back is coming in, you know, if you can't move this stuff, not just the trucks, but getting it on the rail. I read something the other day that just in LA, in LA Long Beach, uh, some of those rail cars, they're like sitting there 30% empty on the rail cars. I mean, rail is ideal to move this stuff up. If you're, if you're double stacking to get it out of there to increase the productivity of, of, uh, of containers going out, containers coming in. Uh, we talked yesterday about the inland terminals that we have we have the one up here in front royal it's a 220 miles from uh from norfolk but and that was built in the 80s uh started out and we thought we lost our mind when we built it but it turned out that everybody wants one but the efficiency of just working with the importers and the exporters you don't have to run your stuff all the way to the port you could do it at an inland terminal if you get a customs clear if customs will work the customs will set it up as a designated entry and exit point uh, you can, those containers coming off a ship can go straight on a rail car up to the inland ports and same thing coming back and it saves all the truckers are going into the terminal. There's multiple ways of doing it to try to get efficiency, but you need, and we'll get into this, but you need cooperation from everybody that's involved. Everybody even comes close to even looking at a container. They all have to work together. And right now that's not happening. That's just not happening, particularly on, on the wet in LA Long Beach. Right, if I can just interject, 
you know, just one thing about this automation, because this is a numbers game. You know, you just got to do the math. I heard a statistic the other day that kind of bowled me over. I think LA Long Beach Christmas time was processing, was it 10 million um, containers, something like that? Um, yeah. Whereas Rotterdam or one of the ports in Europe, it was like 50 million in the same time period. We are an ocean, uh, we are a trading nation, okay? And um, I was shocked to find out that uh, somebody pointed out to me that the Build Back Better legislation that is pending, there is a specific provision that bars the use of that money for automation of the, of the ports. And unfortunately, it's a political decision. And we just have to get over that. So I'll give you a great analogy, you know, from the past. There are some people who believe that the United States triumphed over Japan in World War II because of logistics. So the four-sided pallet and the, you know, forklift, we invented. And that automate, uh, automated our resupply, or at least sped up our resupply of our um, Navy in, in the Pacific. Um, this is a competitiveness issue of the efficiency. Our economy can only be competitive as good as our logistics. And if we can't get goods in and out of our country efficiently, we will lose. Well, and it, and it definitely is to the level of something that's strategically important. And you know, one of the things I think back, you know, it, again, trying to relate this back to, okay, I'm a small business. What am I supposed to do about this? Well, you know, if you think about it this way, um, you know, a lot of us involved in international business, we travel a lot. And everyone can relate to the fact that there are certain terminals you avoid. There are certain airports you avoid, right? I, uh, you know, we all have our stories about, oh, no, this was the only ticket I could get. I'm going to go through that terminal. It's, they're going to lose my luggage. It's going to be a nightmare, right? And... Likewise, a lot of the larger importers and exporters uh, that I work with, they're very conscious of the terminals they use. Now, sometimes you don't have a choice, but again, this is something our small businesses really need to pay attention to in having a conversation with their freight forwarders, you know, that they're using to help help them with their supply chain problems is really being attentive because your your freight forwarders will know which ports, which berths have problems over others. And, and sometimes you, you just have no choice, but if your supply chain is critical to you, certain shipments are critical to you, it's really important to keep in mind that it's not just about the ship, it's also about the rest of the infrastructure in the port. And that kind of leads me sort of the next choke points, and, and these are kind of interrelated, but the whole idea of dwell time. So, you know, for audience, dwell time is basically the amount of time uh, which the cargo ship spends at port, right? And, and, and so that amount of time, time is money. Uh, in return, if you don't know when you're, you're, you can get a hold of your goods, you can be, it can be subject to demerge. So there are all these sort of uh, time delays that are affecting what we call dwell time. So... It's not only if the ship's out at anchor, it hasn't arrived yet, that's, that's affecting time. Uh, along with that, I'm kind of bundling for time's sake these things kind of together, is the fact of truck appointments. We often forget once the goods land and they get through the terminal, there are the delays at the terminal which affect the trucks that have to pick up the containers. Right? Um, so to give our audience sort of a, a context to this, is I know on the West Coast ports, it's roughly about 30% of the truck appointments never get used. So what that means is they don't get to the port on time to meet their appointment. So if you can imagine, you know, hundreds of trucks in line trying to get to their appointments and they're not able, they're, they're not making those appointments. So when we, when we look at that, and, and I know uh, part of the solution has been port hours, which we can get to, but I was wondering if our panelists can weigh in a little bit about this whole idea of both dwell times 
and the truckers that work for the freight forwarders that have to pick up these containers. Well, you got to sit, you have a situation uh, which is sort of different on, on LA Long Beach as, as you have here in, in, in uh, say in Virginia. And, and that is the, uh, the chassis pool. So the problem you have out in LA Long Beach is that those chassis are owned by the individual carriers that, that have them. There's not a chassis pool and you have to wait a trucker's coming in. He needs a chassis from a particular carrier and he has to sit there and wait before he can get that chassis. Then you gotta wait for the container. So the, you have a dwell time on the chassis, you have a dwell time on a container. And also you have a lot of chassis and containers that are sitting empty. They're not even in the terminal, you know? At LA Long Beach, the terminal is totally packed right now. There's no room, so they got to find a place to put it, but they're not matching them. I know that here in, in Virginia, down in, in, in Hampton Roads and Norfolk, they do have a, they have a chassis pool. Anybody can do it. They run the chassis pool. Any carriers can pick them up and take them when they want to. And this, you know, it helps. There's still problems, a, a little bit of problems with the, with the, with getting getting your containers, but out there. Uh, you, it's, and again, you have a situation where those truckers, you know, the one that we, they want to do three or four turns a day and they're, they're lucky if they get one turn a day, if they get in the gate and then they got to sit there and they got to wait. And as long as they wait, it's costing them. And it gets back to Mary, what you said before about the labor situation. You know, you have drivers, you don't have, you don't have, the, you don't have the longshore, you don't have enough truck drivers either. And the truck drivers you do have is I'm not going to just go there and sit all day to grab one box. That is a waste of time. So again, as I mentioned earlier, these, there's a lot of people that are involved in this that need to talk. They need to change. There's too many regulations that are, that are being applied right now. And there needs to be a moratorium on all these regulations. And a lot of these regulations that are in the port right now are driven by labor contracts. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, well, we do. you got the I, ILWU has their contract coming up this year, the negotiations. Everybody's scared to death of what would happen if that goes bad. But there are requirements because of these agreements. They need to put a moratorium on it. Just put it all aside. Everybody at the same table to work this out so the truckers can come in, get their get their boxes, have their chassis assigned to them immediately, and back out the gate of me and do the quick turnaround time. It's just not happening. They know it can happen, but everybody's protected in their own little territory because at the end of the day, it comes down to money. Well, and 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 one of the things I think about too, and and you know, Alan, you were you were mentioning automation of these ports. But then I think about the physical space in the port, right? I, I mean, what, when I look at the ports today, they're the exact same ports that I was using in the 80s. And most of the time, those berths are the same size, right? In terms of acreage, you know, so, so the capacity to hold containers isn't any different than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, depending upon how new that berth is. So, you know, I often think of, you know, those ships that were coming in, you know, 20 years ago were, you know, three, 4,000 container ships. And now uh, you literally don't have the parking space for these. I mean, these, these ports were not configured to handle a 400% increase. Um, so it's, uh, I, I don't know, Alan, if you have any perspectives on that, because I know when you're you know, trying to look at equipment, you also have to look at the space that you have to, to handle cargo. That's exactly correct. The, um, the efficient and smart use of land is one of the biggest challenges that ports have. Um, there are now two examples globally where they're starting to go up with containers as in building large steel structures full of elevators or, or cranes, if you will, that are moving boxes in a structure like Legos. It, it's rather amazing. Uh, in Dubai, they've just finished building a rather large one. Um, so the next big thing is going up with boxes instead of stacking them five high, let's stack them 25 high. Only you got to support that and it costs more money to do so. Um, the, the positive side of that is that if you want any box in the structure, it doesn't take much to get it down. It's configured in such a way that it's doable. Um, the, the challenge though truly is land. And, and you mentioned it, John, a moment ago in, in the LA Long Beach area. And again, we pick on them because they're the biggest target in the country right at the moment. Um, 
they, they're doing more boxes there than anywhere else in North America. Uh, but they just don't have the land to try and accomplish what they're doing. So they move everything off site, which further compounds the delay of moving things. Um, you look around the world to some places like Singapore. Um, Singapore is building the largest conglomeration of container cranes and container moving equipment on the planet. And they're doing it over about the next 20 years. And it'll be an amazing facility, but it's all reclaimed land from the ocean. Uh, they're, they're doing a marvelous job of getting it all done. It's doable, but again, it's money. That John said it a minute ago, follow the money. Uh, folks that are getting it done and moving things quickly normally have one of two things happening. They either have government will behind them. You look at the Port of Savannah, the state of Georgia has an amazing attitude about their port. They fund it, they support it, they build it, they facilitate success through their port. Other states do the same thing. Virginia follows what we do in the port here very much. But I think on the East Coast, I'd have to say between Savannah and Norfolk Harbor, those are your two primary examples of watching a government entity fund and facilitate port growth. And they're doing it well in both places. Um, However, the other flip side of that is when you have a private entity that can pull it off because they're being profitable. And there are plenty of those out there too. Um, you know, DP World, uh, Dubai Port World, out of Dubai, of course, uh, they're kind of backed up by oil money if initially, but these days they're making their own money. So they do a great job of expanding facilities and causing good things to happen. I think for us, though, in the U.S., dealing with, with congestion today, it is such a complex issue. I, I wish we could solve it in an hour. Uh, don't think we will. <laughs> but it, it is such a complex issue. It, if we could all just talk more, and I go back to John's point, I see the same thing happening between the beginning of handling a box and the end of it. There are so many hands that touch it, so many minds that, that facilitate the movement. Everybody needs to be talking more. We're not there yet. Well, and I, and I think for the small business, you know, again, how does this relate to, you know, I'm, I'm the small exporter, U.S. exporter, small importer. What do I do about this? And, and yeah. so some of the things I, I'm seeing is one um, is, unfortunately, you just you have to account for these things in terms of your cost. Um, mm -hmm. There have been uh, several different studies that have looked at the impact of wait time, right? And in, and in some cases, the impact of wait time is equivalent to a tariff, right? So if I look at, if I put my retail hat on, that opportunity cost of losing several days can be another percent per day that you're adding on to the cost of your goods. In, in other words, you, you have to factor that, whether you're passing it on to the customer or not. The, the other thing that's so critical that I see a lot of businesses trying to innovate solutions around is, well, uh, you know, they, they've got to plan ahead in terms of getting the trucks there. You know, um, a typical small business will tell me two, three weeks of planning prior to an arrival to make sure there's a truck available. Some larger companies are actually just reserving trucks and saying, I don't know what day it's going to be available, but I'm reserving a pool because I have enough volume in order to do that. I think in either case, though, it's really important, again, to talk very closely to your, your logistics provider to make sure you have an understanding of how that's being handled. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, again, you know, when, when we didn't have this surge, trucking was sort of an afterthought. It was sort of a, you know, my freight forwarder is going to handle it. It just gets there, and I'm just worried about a booking. But now I have to equally be worried about the supply chain to get it there. The one thing I wanted to sort of unpack for the audience, and, and, and thank you, John, for, for mentioning the topic, is this whole idea of what we call the box rule, right? So kind of deconstructed for our audience, um, you have a container and you have a chassis. And what happens is steamship lines have contracts with chassis companies. 
Therefore, they only want their boxes on their chassis. Um, during this surge that we're experiencing, one of the things that's been happening is, is that if you're an exporter and, and you're, you're going to bring a, you know, a, a container forward, they often want you to not only give one to them, but pick one up at the same time. Or if you're picking up a container, you better have one uh, that you're also on the export side. So oftentimes they're constrained because they don't have the right chassis, they don't have the right container, they don't have an in-out transaction. And um, so, so for example, I'm hearing stories from small businesses of their truckers having to drive around LA to find the right chassis. Um, you know, they, they didn't have a dual transaction, so they couldn't do that. So I'm wondering if any of our panelists can kind of weigh in on, on, on that problem, because often for the layman, we don't even think about that as, as something that's complicated the supply chain. You know, and it shouldn't be that complicated. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the sad part about it. Uh, I think that uh, you know, you, you're right. It used to be a time you just let the forward, you get your truckers down there. There's so many people that are doing the drage work to and from the port. Uh, coming out, whatever happened to uh, container pools that were scattered all over the country where you could just go no matter where you are. If you've got small shippers on here, but it's great if you are a, an exporter or an importer and you live uh, very close to a port. But what do you do if you're living you know, in the middle of the country and the only thing you're dependent upon is, is rail or trucking? If you really want to, you get a trucker who's willing, you're going to pay him to, if he can get his hands on a, on a container and a chassis and drive it to, drive it to a port. Uh, I've done that a lot in the past. I'm sure everybody else has, you know, have had it. But right now, you know, try to get your hands on going to where's the closest container pool. And is that, you know, we talked earlier about all the carriers that they're mixing. Uh, why can't I use an MSC container to put it on a and ship it on a MERS ship and have somebody else's bill lay? As long as I got my hand on a can container, who cares who, who owns that container? You know, that's kind of what you're looking at, right? Just give me a box. I don't care who owns it. Just give me a chassis. I don't care who owns it. You know, they will be, they'll get their fee off of it one way or another, but just keep moving the stuff. But they're not doing that. And I feel sorry for the small exporters and the importers that are totally dependent on this because they don't have the clout or the volume to, to, you know, force and get what they want. They just have to go begging. And as we talked yesterday, and again, we, you need to bring it up again more, Ray, about the importance of the smaller exporters, importers, talking to their, really getting in a close dialogue with their freight forwarders and their customs brokers on how to handle this thing. I know right now on imports coming into the country, especially from China, you know, you're looking at three months, you know, from the time you get it from the factory, from the Chinese trying to get it down to whatever port, waiting for, they have the same problem trying to get containers and chassis and get into the port. It's crazy. It just really is crazy. And uh, I, I, you know, if I had a solution, there is a solution, but they're not, again, they got to get around the table and talk to each other, but it's a get away from just trying to, just to get over, get over this hump. You can go back to what you're doing before, but right now we're in a crisis and everybody needs to work on the same problem. Well, and, the, and there is this groundswell of support in the trade community to the idea of the gray box, right? In, in other words, it's agnostic. Who cares about the chassis? Just just get the cargo moving, and uh, and and that's been a sentiment of a lot. And and, and also too, uh, for our small businesses, it's really important to understand what your forwarder strategy is, you know, and and. And it, this isn't really picking on forwarders, but you know, in a market like LA, there's thousands of freight forwarders, right? And, and some have worked out strategies around this you know, to try to cope with it, and others simply don't have you know, good comprehensive strategies. So it's really important to understand what your service provider is doing in, in terms of how they're strategizing with this. Some larger mid-sized companies, I, I, I've seen some that uh, have actually gone to the lengths of, of owning their own chassis um, um, and, and looking at solutions around that. But for most of our small businesses, it's really important that you understand what that strategy is, you know, because yeah. you, yeah, don't, you don't can't for, take it for granted. Yeah. Don't forget the uh, less than container loads. 
And this is good. That's a big thing. And then you got to talk to the NBOs, you know, at which play because they have their contracts and they have so many containers they need to move on a ship. But you you need to get into that and work with the NBOs, uh, both going and, and, and coming on your cargoes because they play an integral role. You know, because they do have the if, if, if you have a big NBO, then they have the same volume. They're like a big, big, large shipper. You know, they, they can move that as well. They have their contracts for their slots. But again, you're out in the Midwest someplace and you're kind of high and dry, literally, and trying to find it. So you it takes a lot of work uh, to, to do this. And they're at a complete disadvantage right now. You well, know, I think right? it's important to mention. Oh, go ahead, please. When I when I um, worked with larger shippers, you know, the top 1000 shippers, importers, exporters, I was rather struck by their strategy, logistic strategy of avoiding um, Los Angeles, Long, Long Beach at all. And they were having uh, the ocean carriage go to either Port Rupert in Canada or Veracruz in Mexico. And then trucking it down or up into the United States, particularly if it needed to go into the interior of the United States, you know, the Midwest. That that kind of flexibility and almost offshoring, if you will, the ocean side of the logistics supply chain for the larger companies may be trickling down to the smaller companies that are uh, doing e-commerce, particularly if you're using Walmart or if you're using Amazon. You know, Amazon has its own containers. It's getting its own ships, you know, so... I always say transportation or trade are like water, literally and figuratively. It's always going to find the most efficient route. And these inefficiencies that are created because of the fragmentation of our logistics system, because it can be a virtue and a vice. I think most people would be surprised that our ocean ports or ports in general are owned by the local governments and are operated by, you know, marine terminals and um, private sector companies or public private uh, partnership. So that sense it's bottom up. And for the small businesses, you know, they have to do two things. On the commercial side, they really have to work with, you know, the logistics provider or really work with, you know, fulfillment services right? To make sure you've got that flexibility built into your plan. But it's also on the political side of, um, you know, supporting um, improvements to the port that's closest to you. So, you know, there are two aspects to it that small businesses can do. And the other thing that nobody's talked about, and I'll be interested to see how it works out because it's something that we're looking at for Emergent Trade Council is small companies banding together, you know, to create leverage and that volume for logistics companies to be really interested in uh, discounted rates and and more flexibility. And um, you know, those are shipping associations. Yeah, I think that you also need to look too is that the carriers go back to the thing with the carriers. If you look at the, uh, the the number of ship calls coming in right now from the Far East, from New York to Houston, it's increasing. So they're realizing this. Of course, what you have coming into LA Long Beach, those, a lot of those ships going in, they can't go through the canal zone. That's not going to happen. So I mean, there is the added cost. But if you, as a as a an importer or even an exporter, if you take a look at, I want to route it, but I want to route it through an East Coast port. If you're picking up in China, find me a carrier that's got they're doing callings from you know from Shanghai or Tenji, wherever and going through and making calls on the east coast. Uh, the the ports here on that like Savannah uh, here in Virginia, uh, the rail is is so important to what they're moving. It is on LA Long Beach, but uh, if you can go from Norfolk and have your containers come off and on a rail on the Heartland Corridor, you're there in 47 hours, you're in Chicago. You know, with those with those containers. So there's there's options that are available. Maybe a little bit more, but what's more important is you are you trying to save money or are you trying to get your product? You know, are you trying to move that? If there's options available and you put the pressure on the carriers, says, I don't want to go west coast. We're going east coast. Eventually, the carriers are going to fall if they can, if they get and they have the ships to do it. You know, they'll start making those calls. But the, the ports right now. Every one of them are, are doing booming business because they got more ships that are coming in here and they're being diverted. 
Well, and, and one of the things I want to mention too, because as a small business development center, right, we, we help not only international businesses, but domestic businesses. And I, uh, you know, I always remember those truckers, you know, most of those truckers picking up those containers are small business owners and, and, you, you know, the, the carriers, they raise their rates and they're making record profits. But if you look at the truckers, think about it. All these delays we've talked about, uh, and, and, and John uh, mentioned this, is, you know, if, if what it takes to make a living is getting in and out of the port three or four times, and now you can only get in and out of the port once, even if you double the rate, you're still not making yourself whole, right? So, so part of what's compounded all this is we have a truck shortage because if I'm a trucker and I can haul other kinds of freight, I can haul freight for Amazon, I can do short hauls, I can do other types of jobs, I'll pick that over spending an entire day and may or may not get my load, right? Because they don't get to charge for all that waiting time, right? They, they, they make money when they move cargo. And, uh, and that's very important. And so one of the things I want to mention, and, you know, we think about best practices. Well, in this, for small businesses, again, it's, it's looking at alternative routings. It's understanding what your freight forwarder's strategy is to manage uh, uh, the truck situation, getting cargo in and out. But one of the things that I want to mention to our audience, and, and, and a lot of businesses I'm running into don't know about this, but there's an, an earn retention tax credit. And this earn retention tax credit is based on payroll taxes paid and based on retaining employees and, and the damage that you had during the disruption of this pandemic. Well, in certain situations, a disruption to your supply chain also counts on this tax credit program. And we've had small businesses uh, get some substantial tax refunds um, as a result of demonstrating that they were interrupted, their supply chain was interrupted, they had closures, they had to reroute. And so uh, it's real important that our small businesses talk to their tax professionals, talk to their payroll services. Um, if you don't get an answer from any of them, please talk to our small business development centers because I've had uh, manufacturers, uh, you know, I just had a manufacturer get over a million and a half dollars in tax refunds based on this, another client quarter million. So, you know, the, these programs are meant to help keep you whole during this pandemic. So, so please inquire about those programs with your tax professionals. It's, it's January and we need to think about that stuff. So the other thing I want to get to um, and try to wrap this up within our or 10 minutes, and I'll, uh, I'll kind of stack these together, is we have customs issues. And, and, and again, you, you know, the, the feedback that I get from trade professionals, from small importers and exporters is when I ask about port congestion and I ask about customs, they go, well, customs really isn't the problem I'm having, right? So I, 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 in, in that sense, I want to give a shout out to customs because I know how hard they're working. Um, but can anyone allude to some of these issues and, and, and what some of our small businesses should be aware of in, in terms of customs? And then dovetailing that together, because this kind of relates to customs as well, is part of this congestion, we've had a huge surge in e-commerce. And uh, you know, I think another 35% increase in world e-commerce and, and, and that's certainly led to this. And, and in e-commerce is sort of a different animal, you know, when you compare it to general cargo. So um, I'm wondering if we can kind of weigh in on this and, 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 and maybe wrap up with some comments on warehousing. But I know e-commerce is really uh, driving a lot of issues and mm -hmm. great to have you here, Mary. Well, you're lucky because I did get the uh, numbers, the public numbers, uh, from customs. So in fiscal year 16, they had uh, 255 million packages. Okay. 
Uh, fiscal year 17, we had 298 million. So that's an increase of 43 million uh, packages, you know, shipments, you know, parcels, whatever you want to call it. Um, I should say these are what we call 321 or de minimis shipments, okay, that are not paying duties, um, that are entering duty free. So these are basically e commerce shipments. Fiscal year 18, that went up to 494 million. So that's 195 million more. And I didn't do the percentage increase, so I just have the raw numbers. Fiscal year 19, 511 million. Fiscal year 20, 636 million. So that's an increase of 125 million. And then fiscal year 21, we topped out at 771 million uh, shipments, e-commerce shipments. So we went in the scope of you know five years from 255 million to 771 million. So that is an astronomical increase. Now, a lot of that freight is being consolidated uh, in Canada and Mexico in distribution, or even in, in China, you know, in foreign distribution facilities, all those packages are consolidated together into containers and then being shipped over. And don't forget about postal service as well. You know, so I would say two thirds or three quarters of the shipments are going through the postal system and not, you know, the express air couriers, although that capacity has increased as well. Um, so as far as customs, um, you know, they have a couple of issues. We still have a transaction based system, which is problematic. And even the automated systems, the increase in volume uh, for the automated uh, commercial environment or ACE is, is you know, um, causing brownouts and other crashes to the system. So the whole, you know, um, line by line transaction based system has to be modernized. And we do have some pending legislation is coming, you know, uh, about that in the very early stages, but just the numbers are astronomical in terms of its growth. Um, so each year, you know, you're adding, you know, 50 to 100 million packages and, um, you know, how are they gonna keep up with that volume? The other issue with customs that they have is, you know, risk management, uh, how are they going to do risk management on these shipments? Um, but also from a workforce point of view, if you look at LinkedIn, particularly, every aspect of, you know, customs, they're looking for people. So, you know, the last big hiring was, you know, probably when they formed Department of Homeland Security, uh, customs went in uh, with other 22 other agencies. Um, you know, the baby boomers are retiring, you know, they're at the top of their retiring. So the Gen X are taking over. Um, but they need people, you know, they, they really need people as well. And customs itself is one of the most labor intensive federal agencies. As much automation as they have, they are still a, you know, what, 65,000 people, Homeland Security, or, you know, I, I don't know how many people may, maybe Homeland Security is like 250,000 to 65,000 is CBP alone, you know. So you're talking well, about and, a lot of people. Well, one of the things I want to highlight for our audience is, is, you know, you gave those numbers 200 million to 700 million, which is just unfathomable. But let's think for a minute. You've got Amazon and they've got a container, right? And, and there's so much e-commerce volume that, you know, companies are trying to save on the supply chain, right? And they're going to warehouse more, but then they're going to, put things on ocean containers because you can't pull all that on, on air freight, right? There's just not enough planes to do it. But as I understand, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the 321 entry. Basically what that means is all of those consignments, you have to directly identify who it's going to. Yes. So, you know, I'm imagining right now a container with thousands of consignments and in order for that to come through at a lower duty rate, you've got to identify every single one of those packages and, and every receiver is an import of record, which kind of makes it untenable, you know? And, and, yeah, so, and so for our audience, it, 
Yeah, yeah the statistic that I remember, uh, I served as, uh, as Simona said in the introduction, as the private sector co-chair for the WCO e-commerce work group. And my third year, my co-chair was Mike Leahy of Canadian um, Border Security Agency, CBSA. And Mike had the postal um, portfolio for CBSA. And the statistic that sticks in my mind is he said for every container that they had going by truck from Canada to the United States, each container had 80,000 manifests. You know, so 80,000 parcels, you know. So that's a huge number. Yeah, well, and, 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 and so what I think about is it's not going away. And, and for many of our small businesses, sort of, for lack of a better word, the gateway drug to doing their first export or their first international transaction is e-commerce. And, and, and I, 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 I've, I've, I have hundreds of clients who never considered international export and then someone ordered from overseas, ordered their product online, you know? And, and, and so it, it's certainly something that you don't want to go away. You want that sort of democratization of trade, but boy, what a what a strain on the supply chain. And and you mentioned this earlier, Miriam, that in order to get that duty free treatment for that, you know, those eighty thousand packages where one person is ordering, you know, a phone accessory or something, to right. make that duty free, they're actually diverting that cargo to Mexico or to Canada. So then they can bring it in and process it and distribute it. So you, you, we see a lot of this offshoring of cargo. Yes. And, and, and again, it's adding to that complication of, uh, of, 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 the, of the supply chain. And so, yes. um, yeah, and again, this is something that's, that's impacting all of our, our e-commerce small businesses. And sometimes we tend not to think of them as international traders, but what a huge number, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, when we, when we consider that. Yeah, um, this is a math game. Which leads, well, and when you think about that, when, when I talk to people who do e-commerce um, and I say, what's important to you? And, uh, you know, or what do you worry about? And almost all of them, knee-jerk reaction will go, inventory. How do you succeed in e-commerce? Inventory. What do you worry about? Inventory. So, Inventory means warehousing. And, and, and so through this pandemic, even if you get everything through the supply chain, a lot of our small businesses are having to deal with these warehousing issues. And, and, and sort of going back to what we were talking about with, with appointments, I know in the news, we hear a lot about 24-hour you know, ports. But for most of the businesses that we work with as a small business development center, most of our small businesses don't have third shifts. They don't have night shifts. And, and if you have warehouses, they, they don't have night shifts running those warehouses. So I don't know if our panelists can weigh in a little bit on kind of our last topic, which is, you know, once it gets here with e-commerce and all that, um, what do we have to be concerned with in terms of warehousing? Well, we need more capacity. I mean, I, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was out at just out of, at, here at Dulles Airport, where our freight forwarder was, I walked in their warehouse. I mean, there's no room in there. You know, so we're like, they're just chock-a-block full, as is everybody else. And I'm looking around out here. And again, I get them down the port, but just look around here. How many warehouses are being built? And you got to ask the question, who is coming in here? Who is using it? But you got all the stuff that's backed up. So you go back to the issue, again, through the supply chain. You're coming out of the port. You know, the truckers finally got themselves a box. But he's got no place to deliver it because the warehouse is full, you know, or like you said, it's a small distribu distribution center and they're only working certain shifts. They're not working, you know, three shifts or maybe not even working two shifts and they haven't got the labor to do it. So they got to sit on the box and then you get demerge charges on the box and then they charge that back to the importer or it goes in the reverse way and you charge it to the exporter, you know? So space, I mean, right now, if you talk to people in commercial real estate, the hot item right now is building warehouses. You know, warehouses, warehouses, where? What do you want? You want multiple doors, you want rail access so you can bring in rail cars, you know? Right now we talk about what's coming out of the port, but these are all containers, but don't forget, 
a lot of exporters and manufacturers, they're putting stuff in the rail cars and then send it to a distribution center to break that down to put it in the containers. So it goes both ways. Uh, I'm a, I had in my past was a big uh, exporter or importer on uh, bulk. I chartered a lot of ships. So the different problem, different situation, you know, how we're doing and which is where we're getting now where you see the Walmarts and the, you know, and Amazon's is going, you know, heck with this, we're going to go just charter our own ships. It's just much easier for us to do it that way. We'll find an independent port to bring it into. We'll set our trucking system up to handle it. Well, they have that ability to do it and they got the money to do it. But the small exporters and the importers, I mean, they're totally, 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 totally dependent on the logistical supply chain. Uh, every little facet of that, they're dependent upon it. And it's, and it's sad, but uh, there are people in there that are just clogged it up that doesn't make it flow properly. And I think as we talked yesterday, uh, Ray, you know, we said, okay, how do we got a problem right now. I don't want to talk about how we're going to solve the problem, you know, two years from now. We got to talk about how we're going to solve the problem today, you know. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. You got to get everybody in the same room, you know, and they all have to talk to each other. Every one of them, everybody in that supply chain, every single one of them, every one of them has a very important part. And, and they've got just, you know, in the warehouses, that's the back line. That's the final spot. It's going to, if you can't get it there, you can't get it out to the import or export. If that's full, your stuff is just going to sit there. So it, it's a huge problem. Uh, Ray, I was, Alan, I was going to ask well, you a quick question about, you know, on the equipment side of it, is there anything you could think of that would be uh, on, at least on equipment systems or something that could improve upon that within the, uh, the warehousing system and, or even in the ports of how they handle stuff that comes into the terminals? At the terminal side, I talked a moment ago about the going vertical and making boxes. Uh, there have been so many attempts over the years at trying to streamline the process from the ship to the truck gate. Um, again, it, it boils down to money and determination. If people have money they want to spend, they'll determine a way to make it flow quickly. But the challenge is I work in a five-year time horizon. I can't help to fix much of what's backed up today. Um, you know, if someone dreams up a new project five years from now, I might get an order to, to supply the goods. Um, but I look at warehousing, I'll, I'll, I'll shift here for two seconds. I mentioned Savannah a few minutes ago and the fact that they have a huge political will in Georgia to support their port. Uh, that political will boils down to um, making the distribution centers on spec. They go out and build million square foot buildings and nobody wants them um, until they're done. And then they have five bids to fill them up. So they're not building them because somebody said, build me one. They're just building them. And they've been doing it now for about 10 years. So it's like mushrooms around Savannah. Everywhere you look, there's a distribution center. Um, they have a unique ability down there to get that done. In Virginia, we're getting there, I see. Um, in looking around the area around the port, more and more DCs are coming up, but it, it's not a quick process. I would say for yeah. the small well, uh, shippers and the e-sellers in particular, you know, they just want to hand it over to a fulfillment service or a logistics company. Um, don't relinquish control over your freight. It is, you know, the difference between profit and loss, basically. Um, and too many companies, you know, they don't know what they don't know, but uh, never relinquish control over your logistics and your freight. Bring in the professionals, you know, have a well thought out plan, but too many people are, are self-blinding and, and just are relying on the logistics professionals without really understanding. And the whole issue of inventory, Ray, like you talked about, you know, this just-in-time shipment system is fine when it's fine, but when there's interruptions, it's a real problem. Well, you know, again, and we have to wrap this up to open up for questions, but one of the, the number one hotspots, our SBDC does a lot of work with manufacturers, a lot of work with wholesalers, we do a lot of work in Lean Six Sigma, process improvement, and one of the low-hanging fruit we always go to, doesn't matter who we walk into, inventory. 
I, I mean, that is almost, uh, uh, I, I, I go into shock when I go into a business and there isn't some problem with inventory in terms of calculating it, holding too much, holding too little. Um, so it's something that, that and, and, and when you think about it, inventory really impacts the bottom line of a company. You know, that space, you know, uh, you wish everything could be just, in, you know, just in time, pull system. But unfortunately, especially now, we just have no choice but to hold certain kinds of inventories. And, and again, we can't take it for granted. And those costs are, are, are really impactful. So at, at this point, what I'd like to do, thank you, thank you, um, panel. Just a great conversation. I, I, I hope our audience has you know, benefited from this conversation. But at this point, I'd like to hand it back to uh, Simona, open it up for any questions. Great. Um, thank you for the great and much needed conversation. We have a question from Sheila. Um, I'm about to import in a container and my freight forwarder will not give me any time frame of when the container can be offloaded and ready to be picked up in Lo Long Beach LA ports. How can I get some decent estimate of time frame if I use Long Beach and LA port? Um, I did have a suggestion from Federico in the in the Q&A as well, he said, try to use another free forwarder or interview a few of them. Ask your industry colleagues to send you some recommended names. So now back to the panelists, um, if you could help Sheila figure out a time frame. Well, nobody, nobody wants to touch that. that. <laughs> I, just, well, I, I don't blame the custom broker. I mean, given the, given the curtain, situation in there depending on where the vessel is but you know a lot of things that i think they had a again it goes back to the communications they've had if it's just one boss coming in but if they got a broker right now it's their broker until that thing is cleared and delivered to them go ahead ray well one one of the things a, a couple thoughts one is i know like like look at the los angeles market right one largest trade markets 45 percent of u.s trade comes through these ports we have literally thousands of forwarders. And because it's such a competitive market, most of them charge about the same, which means you can always, you know, go for someone who's going to give you some answers or some estimates. And, and if, you don't, if, if you don't feel that your relationship is collaborative with your forwarder, there are other forwarders. Now, how do you find those forwarders? One of the things that, I, that I, I see a lot with our small businesses is they tend to operate kind of in a silo, right? If you look at the more advanced international traders, they belong to trade associations. Um, in Los Angeles alone, we have women in international trade. We have an Orange County chapter, we have an LA chapter, we have the Foreign Trade Association, we have the American Association of Exporters and Importers. Uh, Miriam is the CEO of the E-Merchants Traders Association, and uh, there's an LA Freight Forwarders Association. These associations are really important places to socialize because then you can start to connect um, with other uh, businesses that are trying to battle these same things. And, and a lot of times you get great referrals through those associations, right, because you can kind of socialize your problems. And, and I find quite often that, you know, when I have a trade issue, what do I do? I, I, I go right to my trade associations, district export councils, um, uh, these experts that are more than willing to help me. And, and, and most of the time, the fee for that help is just belonging to the association, right? So, so I, I, I really can't overemphasize the importance of small businesses getting involved in their trade community because um, you know uh, there, there's a lot of good information there. Sometimes the information is just, hey, you can't do anything about this, but here's some tactics to use. But sometimes you get referrals on, on innovative things that others are doing. So I know that's not a perfect answer, but, but one of the things I really find is you know you, you go to some of these trade associations that aren't expensive to join. But you see the same crowd, you know, sort of the larger importers and exporters, but 
there's so much to be gained by being a smaller firm and hooking into these organizations. And, and I think, you know, to Marion's point, joining these uh, 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 consortiums of shippers is going to be the future to, to combine your buying power. Their questions? I noted in the chat the um, LASBDC Go Global contact information, the Virginia SBDC Woman in Trade Orange County, the Emergent Trade Council. If you reach out to the SBDC near you, we can connect you with resources. We can give you whatever information you need to help you find solution. Um, I see a question from Alan. Um, is Air Cargo now getting competitive with Ocean? I didn't type that. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> well, it's a good question, though, so I think we should take it. <laughs> I think we should take it as a good question. I, for, yeah. for me, as an expert advisor, I get this question from our clients all the time. I have importers who are importing products and then exporting, but not able to meet the deadline, not able to meet the uh, their purchase order because um, they don't receive the cargo on time. So any suggestions, any ideas you could um, give to our small businesses, uh, please do so. I mean, air freight's oh, always think, an option. And I think the answer is there are two Alans here, so. Oh, Alan Peterson. <laughs> yeah, uh, air, air freight's always an option. I mean, it's still expensive if you take it because they're charging, you know, uh, for kilo rates on, on that, depending on where you're coming from. It's it's not going to be, I mean, considering, as what Ray was saying earlier, the cost of a, of a full container. I mean, if you're bringing in small shipments, you know, something small, yeah, you could consider doing an air freight if you've got to have it and you could build it into your margins and look at the airlines that are coming. Because the airlines are, they are moving. And, and a lot of the, you know, finally with, with COVID lift, lifting, and, and with the COVID issues, but a lot of the passenger aircraft, you know, when it first started, you couldn't even get anything because there were no passenger aircraft. Most of those passengers, all the passenger planes are carrying freight. Now they're out. And, and in fact, if you looked at their numbers, you know, if it wasn't for freight, those, those all those airlines would have lost more money than they did. But they carried a lot of freight. So, yeah, I mean, in small quantities, I would I would say, yeah, bite the bullet, send it by air freight. Don't even try send it in a consolidated container or with an NVO or something, because you're going to wait a long time. And as I gave an example yesterday, I made a shipment to uh, Frankfurt, Germany back in September. I shipped it over by an, uh, by an NVO. I mean, excuse me, I flew it over to Frankfurt, and I brought it back by an NVO. And, the, and <clears throat> I've had about, I had about 500 kilos, and the difference in the freight was only $1,000 between the air freight and the ocean freight. And I go, geez, and then I would have had it, if I would have flown it, I would have had it in a week as compared to waiting two months, how long it took me to get it. So you just, you, again, that's something you have to talk to your, your forwarder about and your broker, but I would, I would look at it. I would look at it closely to make a comparison that says it's worth it, that I can, I can offset that on, on flying it in instead of bringing it in by ocean freight. Absolutely. Well, and, 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 and this very much goes back to, you know, <laughs> trade professional fundamentals here is that it, it's very important as, uh, as a company doing international trade to understand what your cost per cubic meter is, whether it's air freight, ocean freight, less than container load. And, and, uh, and it's really important to understand that, you know, density of cargo, volume of cargo. So a lot of times, uh, and, and particularly with the spike in, in freight rates now, um, you really have to take a second look at, at air freight. The other thing I would throw out too is, so there are these kind of intermediate steps too. You know, there, there's combinations of, you know, ocean truck freight, air truck freight to kind of, you know, uh, draw a balance between when, when you need to get it there and the cost structure. Um, so those are important things to look at and, 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 and again, you know, so much of the solutions in freight are around strategy, you know, managing the supply chain. You know, I, you know as a supply chain professional, right, you, uh, I always think about the fact that you, you can't control what you charge people for, for whatever industry you're in, and you can't control what you pay for your raw materials and services. So 
you have to manage your way through that. Any other questions? I don't currently have more questions in the chat. I do wanna make a final point and this might be a little provocative. I think John may have alluded to it in an earlier remark about if you know the longshoremen, we have a difficult contract negotiations could be catastrophic. In some ways that might be the best thing, you know, sort of like the teachers unions, right? You know, you have to look back and say, who are they serving? Whose interests are they serving? And at some point it may break the log jam that we've needed for automation, but also I know it's receded from the headlines because of the FAA's um, delay in regulations, but I think you're gonna see increased pressure to allow more experimentation with drone delivery. Now, obviously we're in the early stages of what it can carry and stuff like that, but I think you're going to see more creative solutions to a more holistic um, and flexibility of the supply chain. And it, it pains me to say this, but I've just seen this pattern over and over again. Whenever you have inefficiencies or you know, corruption issues or, or, or things that are detrimental, you always go back to the people. People are the problem sometimes in these systems. And I'm not one of these utopian um, um, futurists with, you know, technology is gonna solve all our problems. Clearly that's not true. But I think the age of innovation and supply chain and we in the United States definitely have to reinvest in assets and infrastructure uh, because our disinvestment has caught up with us. Well, and, and, I, and I think I think too when I when I think about the evolution of air freight, right? Because I'm I'm old enough to remember general air cargo without express cargo, you know, and and sort of how you know the FedExes of the world sort of disrupted the business model, and and that and and that FedEx solution was an end to end solution, you know, and and unfortunately what what is I think the transition that ocean freight's going through, and I think e-commerce is fueling a lot of this, is the you know, ocean freight was never considered an end-to-end -end solution, right? It was like, well, you know, okay, it's leaving the foreign port. Whenever it gets here, it gets here. Now it's going through the terminal and the terminal's going to do whatever it's going to do. And then they're going to offload it. And, and that's not necessarily connected to the truck driver that picks it up and delivers it, right? And, and, and so now, you know, with the increase in cargo, the demand, you know, customer expectations, now all of a sudden we have this, you know, oldest mode of trans international transport is ocean. And now we're having to take something that's, that's traditionally been pretty disparate and think about end-to-end -end solutions. And, and uh, it's kind of a future looking statement and, some would say that will never happen, but you know, uh, as as you said, Marion, markets find a way, our entrepreneurs mm -hmm. find a way, and and uh, um, yeah. I think there's going to be some changes because we just can't accommodate the demand at what we're doing currently. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, and you're right, Marion. I think there are a lot of brilliant people out there, and you know, containerization is just the next step, right? We are not what's after containerization. You ask yourself that question. It always reminds me of my very young days. I'm really going to date myself here, but I was I was working for a freight forward custom broker, and I was a marketing director. I ran everything in Central America, and I was in Guatemala City, and there was a Guatemalan carrier break bulk. That's all they had. They didn't even have. They're just starting with the railroad carriers and uh, called Flamerica Lines. And there was all break ball. For those who don't remember, just look. There were no containers. You had to do it the old fashioned mm -hmm. way, loading crates and everything in the containers. So I was, they were just starting with the containerization and the roll on, roll off ships. And I mentioned to the senior vice president of Flamerica, I go, wow, this is really interesting. He goes, containers? That's never gonna work. <laughs> of course, that guy probably—I don't know—you know—he's dead now. I should be dead yeah. now, but that's another story. But yeah. that's the point. These things just evolve, and and what causes things to evolve? 
situations like we have right now. We got a massive problem on our hands. People are thinking about how can we get around this? What is the future going to look like? How they're going to solve it? But it will happen. It will not going to happen today, but it, it will happen. And just ask Alan and all the how just basic crane operations went from basic crane operations into something that's just a gigantic computer that's got everything in the world that thinks on its own, moves quickly, and they do it all. But my, you know, my great fear uh, is my great fear is that we're not going to spring into action until the ocean based global trading system is challenged by the land based global trading system of China's one belt, one road. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Well, I, yeah, that's a whole different. Yeah, we're ready for that one. Yeah. He's got another two hours. Hey, <laughs> Yeah, I know we have to wrap things up because we're out of time. But again, I want to thank our panel. It's so cool to have discussions like this. And again, I I hope our audience uh, found a lot of value in this discussion, some things to think about, and 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 hopefully, you know, kind of kind of reaffirm that um, you as small businesses out there, you're not the only ones feeling this. And there's a lot of people really trying to work on these solutions and and. Uh, we're here to help. So I'll leave it uh, to you, Simona, to wrap us up and end us. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you to our speakers, our attendees, for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, this concludes our first program. Please connect with us. Let us know what other topics you might want us to discuss in future, um, in future programs. Um, and do not hesitate to contact LASBDC and Virginia SBDC if you have any questions, you need our support, you need resources. As Ray said, you're not alone and we're here to help you find solutions and to help you find answers. I do this every day. So um, do contact us and thank you again for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.